This Zero Now program is brought to you with the support of our founding partners. I'm just one person. Determined. To bring us back to zero. I'm just one person. Determined. To bring us back to zero. I am just one person. Determined. To bring us back to zero. Welcome, folks. I'm Ara Begdasarian, the board president of Zero Now. And welcome to our very first sessions uh, webinar by Zero Now, entitled COVID-19 and Campus Safety with Dr. Megan Ranney. Just a little background. Zero Now is the stakeholder alliance formed to drive innovation, funding, and policy for safe campuses. As a member-based nonprofit, Zero Now facilitates collaboration between industry, association, and education partners to foster new solutions to keep our schools safe and secure. Before we get started, we want to recognize our sponsors and founding partners who made this program possible. Thank you to Access Communications, Additional Corporation, Telos Corporation, OmniAlert, IACLEA, VTV Family Outreach Foundation, and NASPA, Student Affairs Administrators in Higher Education. If you're interested in learning more about Zero Now or becoming a member, please visit zeronow.org. Now, I'd like to introduce our very special guest. Dr. Megan Ranney is a practicing emergency physician, researcher, and advocate for innovative approaches to health. That's why she's here. It's all about innovation. Her work focuses on the intersection between digital health, violence prevention, and population health. Dr. Ranney is the Associate Dean of Strategy and Innovation for Brown University School of Public Health, as well as founding director for the Brown Lifespan Center for Digital Health. She's the co-founder and Senior Strategic Advisor to the American Foundation for Firearm Injury Reduction in Medicine, also known as a firm at the Aspen Institute, which creates practical, scalable, and immediate health-based solutions to reduce all forms of firearm-related injuries in the United States. She also serves on the, as a president of the board for GetUsPPE.org, a startup dedicated match for matching donated personal protective equipment to those who need it most. She's a fellow of the fifth class of the Aspen Health Innovators Fellowship Program and a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. Dr. Ranney's work has been featured on, by hundreds of media outlets, including CNN, MSNBC, the BBC, New York Times, the Washington Post, and Fox News. Please welcome Dr. Ranney. Thank you, Ara. It is a joy to be here with you. Awesome, awesome. So for our participants, just want to give you a heads up on the format uh, we have a number of questions that came in advance uh, relating to COVID-19 and health, health policy for campuses, just keeping your schools safe. And if you have questions during the webinar, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your interface. Uh, you can ask questions uh, during the webinar. Uh, we'll, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. We have about 30 minutes during the session. Uh, Dr. randy has got a very busy schedule, and she's uh, very gracious that she had time to join us today. So thanks, Dr. Randy. Of course. So our first question comes from uh, the University of Houston Police Department from Cesar Moore. Uh, the question is, what is the largest shortcomings you have observed in contact tracing programs? Uh, where to begin? The largest. I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges with contact tracing programs in general is that we don't do them by and large. It has been one of those strategies in infection control that we've abandoned really over the last 20 months, just because there have been too many infections. Um, the other big shortcoming is, is that I've watched us spend a lot of time on doing that backwards tracing rather than the forward tracing, looking at if we have an event, kind of who gets infected going forwards rather than going back and saying, oh, let me find every single person you were around um, over a you know, two day period prior to when you got diagnosed. Um, I think there's, this is a space where there's a lot of opportunity for us to innovate, probably not during this pandemic, realistically, although it's going to drag on um, for months, if not years to come, uh, but rather thinking forwards into future respiratory illness outbreaks. Um, I know there've been some programs, including some that have been initiated on university campuses nationwide um, to allow digital tracing and contact notifications, um, which is a much more feasible strategy in the context of this kind of a wide blown, um, widespread respiratory virus. And do we know if, if, if universities are 
using the apps. I know most uh, most states had an, a, a, some sort of contact tracing app, but are, are universities employing those on, a, on an active basis? So today, we're like, as we stand, not so much. Last year, some universities that did reopen, um, University of Illinois Champaign, for instance, did a really nice um, deployment. Um, Kansas, um, had an app that they used. So there have been scattered examples. And when those apps were used, they showed success in terms of both identifying people who were in close proximity to someone who's diagnosed. And again, in that kind of forward tracing um, of, of where infections are landing to allow us to identify where those hotspots are and do mitigation measures. Um, another neat thing that I saw, for instance, from University of Michigan, is allowing uh, identification of places where more people were gathering than they were supposed to. Um, so if you know they use their Wi-Fi signal, they were able to see, hey, there's a there's an informal student party going on, um, despite our limits on the number of people that can be gathered in a particular space, which allowed to better manage um, potential exposures in real time. Right now, in fall of 2021, many, if not most, universities have abandoned. Some of those digital strategies, um, very few of us, for instance, are still doing daily symptom checks before we come onto campus. That was required for many um, healthcare facilities and universities throughout last year. So I think that as the pandemic's nature has changed, universities' responses have changed as well. Uh, thank you. It makes sense. Our next question is from uh, the University of Arizona. Uh, Robert Summerfield asks, what professions or careers or fields do you recommend as critical and need priority for vaccinations and boosters? Is there any specific? Uh, so, know? yeah. So, I mean, I think everyone needs priority for vaccination right now. Um, and within the United States, we're lucky that we have enough supplies that every one of us um, who is age 12 plus can go and get our initial vaccination series right now. You know, there are certainly some groups who have lower rates of vaccination than others. Um, we have found that up until some of the mandates around healthcare workers were in place, our nursing home employees were unfortunately one of the ones that was had lower rates of vaccination. We're also seeing that unfortunately a lot of our um, public facing um, public safety positions, our firefighters, police um, in particular, have had lower rates of vaccination than the overall population. Um, I think it's essential for those folks to get vaccinated, both to protect themselves um, because they're out in public facing spaces, um, potentially crowded with minimal precautions and so are gonna be high risk for catching COVID. If our public safety positions get, if folks get sick, if we're down, you know, in my own town, we actually lost, um, had our, an entire um, cohort of firefighters be taken out of commission for two weeks because one person had COVID spread it to other folks who were not yet vaccinated. Um, and, and our town really struggled in terms of responses to emergencies over that two week period. So there's a huge public safety kind of ripple effect if someone gets sick. And then of course there's our, you know, same way as in healthcare, there's our responsibility to our constituents. And you would hate to have someone pass COVID on to someone that they're out there trying to help. Um, so it's a place that I wanna see us put a lot of emphasis in terms of those first vaccinations. So that's the primary series of vaccinations. Um, short answer is everyone, right. um, but, but there are some groups that you know, we, we still have to um, build up confidence um, in the vaccines. In terms of boosters, I was just having a conversation with someone about this. It's a little more complicated. Short version is if you are immunosuppressed in any way, please go get a booster today, regardless of what your primary series of vaccines were. We know that people, as we just saw with Colin Powell's death, um, we know that people who are immunosuppressed are less likely to mount an immune response from their first series of vaccines. They do need boosters. And General Powell had not received his booster yet. Um, which is part of the reason potentially probably that he, he um, succumbed to COVID. Outside of that, if you're age 65 plus or have multiple chronic conditions, you should probably can strongly consider going and getting a booster, particularly if you got Pfizer. 
or j and I'm expecting the J&J boosters to be officially approved any day now. Um, Moderna is a little kind of more on the edge. The Moderna vaccines are showing terrific staying power even against Delta variant. If you are in one of those higher risk categories, I, you can still go get a booster, but for kind of the average healthy person, probably don't need one, at least not right now, if you got Moderna as your primary series. So Dr. Rani, uh how, from a from a policy perspective, how should universities, schools um, address um, staff, employees, especially first responders, uh, law enforcement, campus safety um, that are public facing that that are not interested in receiving the vaccination? How do you how how do we handle how do we handle that? Because that is certainly a risk. And you mentioned uh, the fire department that was completely wiped out because of because of COVID-19 and uh, infections, how, any guidance on the on policy regarding that? Yep, so, so I think it's a combination of policy and listening and conversations. Um, obviously in my position, I do a lot of conversations with folks who have concerns about the vaccines. I find that the vast majority of them have real questions that haven't been answered. And we could talk all day about the misinformation and disinformation that is so easily available on social media right now um, and is so easily spread from family member to family member or friend to friend. And I think that one of our roles as public health officials, as university leaders, et cetera, is to help combat that misinformation through listening sessions, webinars, one-on-one drop-ins. It creates space for people to get questions answered um, and to help move them towards vaccination. I also think there's a strong role for mandates. Um, And here at Brown, we have put mandates in place for staff, for faculty, and for students um, with very, very few exemption possibilities. We've done a few, but it's really a handful um, across our entire campus. I think there's value to mandates for a couple of reasons. First is we have mandates around lots of vaccines. This is not something new or different. You require that kids get a meningitis vaccine before they show up on campus as a first year. You have to get your tetanus vaccine. Um, There's lots of things out there that we require vaccination for. You can't show up in kindergarten without your primary series of vaccines. So this is not something unusual or different. And the Pfizer vaccine has full FDA approval at this point. Moderna soon will. Um, It's not like we're asking people to do something experimental or dangerous or outside the bounds of what we've always done. The second part is, is that a mandate can provide a cover or an out for people who are considering vaccination, but feel, and I know you and I had this conversation the other day, people who feel like they've made a statement that they don't want to get a vaccine because of, you know, whatever reason, whether it's political or fear or whatever, you know, they've, they've said that they're not going to get vaccinated. Having a mandate in place can provide cover for them to, you know, if they're on the fence and wavering to show up and get vaccinated. And then the third thing behind a mandate is really it keeps us, our campuses, the people that we care about and are responsible for, it keeps them safe. Um, You know, as a healthcare worker, I would never forgive myself if one of my patients got sick because I or one of the staff that I work with was unvaccinated and therefore more likely to catch and transmit COVID. And we got one of my immunosuppressed patients ill. I would never forgive myself. I was talking this morning to a fellow faculty member whose spouse is an organ transplant recipient. She deserves to be able to come to work and to know that everyone around her is vaccinated. And so she's safe being here and isn't going to go home and, you know, potentially kill her spouse, who's going to have a less robust response to the vaccine. I have other colleagues who are receiving chemo. They deserve to be able to come to work knowing that the people around them are vaccinated. And so I think that part as well of the mandate is that it's part of us looking out for our community and kind of putting a um, stake in the ground that we care about each other and we're committed to keeping each other safe. The last part is, is that I will say that with full vaccination, it allows us to move towards a maskless reality. And we're having these discussions. Yay. I know, right? Get back yeah, there I again. The yes. thing about Zoom. But, but I really do. I am, you know, I've been super pro masks throughout this pandemic, but I want to be clear that it is not masks forever for everyone. Always. I think many people may choose to wear masks. Partic- I don't know that I will ever take my mask off on an airplane ever again. Right. Um, yeah. But like, but when I'm having a meeting with a fellow faculty member, if we're both vaccinated, 
Uh, and I know that my community here at Brown is entirely vaccinated. And I know that our infection rate is like nothing. Um, we're going to be safe to take masks off pretty soon. We're going to get through cold and flu season, but um, because we don't want everybody to be absent. Um, but I, 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 that that's the last part is that the vaccines move us back towards normal within our bubbles of the university or school communities. That's great, Dr. Randy. Yeah, no, I, I, and it's interesting. I mean, so many people that you meet met in person masked, you know, the entire time. And then there are certain folks that you met solely via Zoom uh, and you meet them in person. It's a unique experience. We have so we have so many questions that came in pre uh, during registration. We had a number of questions, though, that that uh, circled around uh, kind of piggyback on that. How is how is COVID-19 different from the flu? Is, is this not just uh, just another strain of the flu? How is it different? It's a great question. So I'm going to start like with the microbiology of it. It is a totally different type of virus than the flu. There's the influenza, and then there's a coronavirus. COVID-19 is a specific, typically coronaviruses are out there and just give us the common cold. There are a few coronaviruses though, over history that have been super dangerous. SARS being one of them. Um, there's another one called the Middle Eastern Respiratory um, Syndrome or MERS that had us all on high alert, but luckily never were as in, didn't ever spread as easily as COVID. And we're also just a little bit more lethal. So they actually kind of killed themselves out. SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID is in that coronavirus family and is just dangerous and lethal enough to cause the havoc that we've seen globally over the last year and a half just transmissible enough to spread really easily. And it happens to spread when you are in the asymptom kind of pre-symptomatic phase or minimally symptomatic. Whereas, so you could be out and about and think, you know, oh, I just have a little tickle in my throat and actually be infectious. Um, and is just easily spread enough that you can be in a room with someone for a little bit and catch it. There are other viruses out there which are tougher that you have to actually touch someone or be exposed to droplets. The SARS-CoV-2 virus spreads really through the air and so is much more infectious than many other common viruses. So totally different virus from the flu has these really unique things that make it particularly dangerous and have caused these pandemic conditions. And then unfortunately, whether it's because we've never been exposed to it before or whether it's because of things unique to the COVID-19 syndrome, it is much more severe than the flu. It causes a much higher number of severe diseases and hospitalizations among otherwise healthy young adults and adults, as well as, of course, among older folks compared to the flu. And it causes much higher death rates, um, which we measure as general, it's we talk about like case fatality rates. So of people that we know have COVID-19, a higher proportion of those folks die than the death rates from flu. And that's true among all age groups. Flu typically kills the really old and the really young. And I hate flu season as an ER doc. I mean, it's a horrible, it, it can be a really horrible disease for people who are otherwise sick or at the extremes of age. But for the average person, flu makes you feel horrible for a week and then it goes away permanently disables or kills very, very few of us in the prime of life, you know, except for like Spanish flu, which was a bad thing. COVID is different. COVID not only gets those in the extremes of life, but also gets those of us who are otherwise healthy in a very unpredictable way. And is causing a lot of long-term symptoms for a lot of people who catch it, even if they survive that kind of so-called long COVID syndrome. There's something truly different about it. Will it's Severity decrease over time as the world gets used to it. And as many of us have either been vaccinated or exposed, that's the hope is that a year from now, we're going to, COVID's going to look different and feel different. And it's just going to be part of our normal year to year variation, same as flu, but we're not there yet, unfortunately. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, the, the age range. Uh, we have a number of folks from schools, uh, K through 12. We have obviously mm -hmm. a lot of uh, higher education. Um, how does COVID uh, affect children uh, differently than, than adults? Is there any difference? I know there's been a lot of different uh, uh, reports on, on the impact of COVID on children. So what is, what is the, what's, what's, what's the, the science say? Yeah, it's a great question. So early on in the pandemic, we thought that COVID did not affect children because of course all our kids were home from school and it wasn't spreading among kids. 
kids because right. they weren't around each other. Um, we have since found uh, last spring and this summer, right, particularly with the alpha and the delta variants, these new versions of COVID, we found that COVID does affect children. And in fact, it was among the leading causes of death for kids in the United States this year. Um, it displaced a number of other common causes of childhood death. Now, does it hurt or get, you know, make kids as, kids are less likely to be severely ill, less likely to be hospitalized, thank God, less likely to die of COVID compared to say my, you know, your grandmother or your parent, but it is not benign and kids in general are less likely to get sick or hospitalized or die than old people. So even that small bump up can be really significant in the overall burden of childhood diseases. Now, is that sickness enough for us to say, we need to keep our kids home? I will say very strongly that I have been pro school opening since summer of last year, 2020. And in fact, my children's school district reopened in October of 2020 and has been open throughout the pandemic with universal masking, as well as with some other basic precautions. Having kids able to do things together is critically important to their emotional and physical health as well. <laughs> but we got to do both, right? We can't, we have to figure out ways to keep them health, safe and healthy, just as we do again, by giving them shots for other childhood diseases, by telling them they have to wash their hands. We do lots of things by putting them in a car seat. We do lots of things to keep our kids safe from rare but real illnesses and, and potential sources of death at the same time that we try to get them in school and keep them educated and keep them emotionally and social, socially and academically um, advancing. So, uh, masks. So, so uh, we had a few questions about masks. So when can the masks come off? Is there a certain threshold that must be met before students could attend school again without wearing masks? It's a wonderful question. No, I, if anyone tells you they know for sure, they're making up the answer. We are taking best guesses as to when masks can come off. What I am, I'm, I'm gonna kind of make a little bit of a leap here. Within the next month or so, we are going to see guidelines around when your population, including your school, gets to a certain level of vaccination and your community level of infections drops below a certain level. And it's gonna be somewhere around, I'm gonna be, I'm kind of, extrapolating here, but it's going to be somewhere around 80, 75 to 80% community vaccination rates, as well as infection rates that are in that low region of the CDC charts that masks can come off. We may even see masks come off with moderate community transmission if you have high rates of vaccination within your schools. The question is going to be for those elementary school grades, because we don't yet have vaccines for the five to 11 year olds. At what point do we let their masks come off? And there's going to be a lot of debate over this over the next few months. And we're going to be watching and measuring to see what happens. Today for elementary schools, unless we are willing to open all the windows, improve ventilation, do regular testing, which is what some other countries are doing. Say my sister lives in Switzerland. Her elementary school kids go to school without masks, but they have open windows, uncrowded classrooms, and regular testing. And all of the adults are wearing masks indoors and their vaccination rate is high and their infection rate is low. That's a scenario in which we can get the masks off the elementary school kids younger. I'm hopeful that we'll move there. We need a little bit more data and a little bit more time. Great, and that leads us to the next question from Susan Morrison from the College of Charleston. Um, and this is, this, this is interesting. So is monitoring carbon dioxide in rooms as a proxy for ventilation a viable way of assessing uh, safety. I love that. So those, those CO2 monitors, which many of you have read about in the newspapers or seen stories about or heard on the radio, these are a great way to monitor um, kind of overall level of ventilation. And they can be a really good proxy for your um, classroom not having adequate ventilation. If you have a great filter in place, sometimes those don't actually suck out the CO2 
So it may not be a good measure of whether your filter is working or not. It's really more of a measure of airflow. So if you have a very good filter, you, you may not be able to use the CO2 monitor as, as a proxy. Um, but I think it's a great way to start to get a sense if you have no ventilation mitigation measures in place to start to get a sense of where you need to be changing airflow or putting high quality air filters, you know, HEPA filters, et cetera, in place. We have a question here from uh, the Department of Homeland Security. Um, with all DHS uh, employees, and this is across the board with, with, um, with campus as well, with, with all DHS employees mandated to get vaccinated, will we have to continue to use face coverings indoors? So if you're vaccinated, you need to wear a face mask. Yeah, so for today, in most of the United States, given that most of the U.S. is in moderate or high tr transmission, yes, you do need to still wear a face covering indoors. But again, I anticipate that to change pretty soon. Um, we're seeing the downswing of the Delta wave in most of the United States right now. We are seeing increasing numbers of vaccinations. I am um, can't speak for federal policy at this point but I am expecting that we're gonna see some changes in recommendations within the next month or two, assuming that our trends stay the way that they are. I will say that the thing that none of us wanna see is that we have a repeat of what happened this spring, where we said masks off for the vaccinated, and then it was like, boom, it set up the perfect storm for Delta variant to take hold. Because of course, people who were vaccinated and people who were unvaccinated all took their masks off, and it's just Delta took us over, right? Um, we don't want to set us up for another scenario like that, where we are going through another horrible surge. But within these highly vaccinated communities, assuming that we have some sort of assurance that people actually are vaccinated, I do foresee us taking those masks off in the near future. And I will be honest, I am taking my mask off when I am with a fully vaccinated small group, where I know that folks are also practicing kind of some basic, where, where I know that kind of our baseline rate of um, COVID is low not doing it in like a group of like 150 people, but if I'm in a room with two or three or five or 10 other people who are all fully vaccinated, I'll take my mask off. Um, interesting. Um, I was just at a, um, at a James Madison university football game. Uh, uh, is there guidance? Is there, is there uh, guidance uh, di directives for, um, for outdoor activities like, like football games? So many universities are, are fully um, uh, occupying stadiums without masks? Is there any, any guidance on, on that front? So outdoors is in general really, really safe because you have great ventilation by definition. The one exception is when you have people super crowded in and breathing kind of right on each other and there's no airflow around them, um, that that can be a somewhat riskier scenario. But in general, this is where you're kind of weighing risk versus benefit making people mask at the James Madison football, like at the, you know, like that's not, it's not going to happen. And chance of there being a super spreader event there is so small. Like, is that really the thing that we're going to hang our hat on? Probably not. And you just have to look at Lollapalooza as an example, right? Everyone was like, mm -hmm. oh, Lollapalooza right. is going to be this horrible thing. They're virtually, not, I say, I actually went on TV and said, I wasn't super worried about it. Some of my colleagues were like, oh, she's, how can she say it's not scary? And it's like, well, how they're dare outdoors, you? right? And, and it turned out to actually be tremendously safe because folks were vaccinated and they were outside. That, and that makes sense. I mean, I think that that's clear. If, if you're vaccinated, you're outdoors. And I know most universities are, are vaccinated. They require vaccinations for students returning to campus. Um, we have a, there's a question that came online from Jason Friedberg along those lines. So do you feel there are more options for private schools? I, uh, for example, University of Penn uh, over public schools uh, when it comes to the, you know, being able to mandate uh, certain policies. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, public schools have to follow your state government guidelines. So private schools certainly have a little more latitude. Um, there are also obviously union considerations and collective bargaining concerns that have to be taken into account, um, which are usually more prevalent among public schools than among private schools. So there's definitely a difference um, in the types of kind of bureaucratic regulations and um, guidelines that you're gonna have to follow, but that's true for most things um, that public schools are, you know, public universities, um, have to follow their state's regulations um, to a greater, you know, there's a little more latitude for the, for the public universities.
or excuse me, for the private ones. The private ones. Um, I know you're, uh, you need to get running soon. Do you have time for one more question? Totally. I'll do one. Yes. <laughs> okay. One more question. All right. Uh, this comes from Bruce Canal. The uh, question is, uh, and I think this sums it all up. Will COVID-19 be permanently expelled or will we be dealing with a derivative of, of COVID-19 forever and definitely into the future? So anyone who says that we are going for zero COVID, no offense. So zero now, yes, I'm totally on board. Zero COVID, not going to happen. COVID is going to be around. It's going to be part of our lives, our children's lives, our grandchildren's lives. Um, it will continue to mutate. Um, we're going to continue to deal with some years or months that are worse and there are surges and some that are better. The goal here is to move us past this acute pandemic phase. This that we have been living in for the last 20 months is not how the world is going to continue to look. And in fact, hopefully most of you are starting to see things opening up. I'm here in my office, right? I was not here if we had done this webinar six months ago, I would not have been here. Um, I'm getting on a plane tomorrow. Most of us were not doing that six months ago. So you know, we're starting to see things reopen. Society is going to start to move back towards what we remember. Um, with some changes because pandemics change society, but it's never gonna go away. Unfortunately, we are always going to have older folks and uh, older folks and who are gonna be susceptible. We will hear of COVID deaths probably for the rest of our, you know, however long we all live, some of us may succumb to it, hopefully not now. And, and the goal is to try to minimize the illness and the suffering um, and to make this survivable and to make it so that we don't have to experience those long-term consequences, the long COVID syndrome to minimize that as well. Great. No, that, that, that makes sense. It's something we have to, to, to deal with and adapt as humans. And that's how, that's, that's how we uh, continue to survive. Well, Dr. Randy, really appreciate you taking the time today to join us and answer questions from our Zero Now community. A lot more questions, but uh, maybe we'll find some time right. to do a, a follow-up session uh, in the near future. I would love that, Art. It is a joy to join you. Thank you. Um, truly an honor and a privilege to get to be here with you today. So. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Annie. And uh, for the folks joining us, uh, our next webinar is November 16th. We're going to start a three-part series on active shooter prevention. Um, if you're if you're inter interested, please go to zeronow.org. The registration form will be uh, live within the next week. And uh, if you have any questions, please go to zeronod.org and reach out and we'll, we'll be in touch. But thanks, Dr. Rani. Everyone have a good uh, rest of the week. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Take care.